In previous videos, I have looked at various versions of these STC-1000 generic clone type temperature controllers. And ones like this one, 100 to 220 volt, they usually don't have great power supplies inside and they don't have good electrical separation from things like the low voltage uh, temperature probe. However, I decided to go on and get a decent one that you might find in commercial equipment. And again, it is manufactured in China, everything is. But this one is definitely a cut above. I got this from eBay. It was a lot cheaper than the standard ones because I get the feeling that the person that was selling it didn't know how to use it. And also thought it was for refrigeration. It's not. This one is for heating. Uh, the instructions that come with it are in Chinese, but I did find a fairly sensible data sheet and can explain the functions of it. So first thing that is notable, it comes with a traditional transformer. This is a potted 2 volt amp transformer. Let's zoom down a little bit. Rated for 12 volts AC output at 160 milliamp. That is separate from the unit itself. And that means that if the power supply burns out, you can just change the power supply. Although having said that, this is a traditional chunky, heavy uh, magnetic transformer. So it's very unlikely to fail. Next, we have the unit itself, which takes that AC supply in. And it has three sets of cables coming out the back. It's got the temperature sensor with a nice rugged rubbery cable. Uh, and it's got the power in and the... Uh, two spade connectors. The two spade connectors are for an external relay and unlike the little cheapy ones that have suspicious tiny relays in them with a very very debatable rating on them, this is using a Hong Shuan. Hold on let me just get the let me just zoom in in this with my magnifying glass. It's a Song, Song Shuan Relay, and if this is real, this is a fairly good quality relay. And you basically get the speed connectors, and they go on to the two small connectors, and then you switch your load externally to the unit just with these two terminals here. And it is rated theoretically up to 30 amp. It's rated for switching compressors, and it's rated for switching heaters directly. And again, if this fails, you just pull off these connectors, you screw another one on, and that's you fix. You don't have to change the whole unit. So let me hook this up. So I have somewhere here a little mains supply cable and I shall find a suitable screwdriver here. And it's notable, I wonder if there are, there's a circuit board in here because the terminals here are typical circuit board type terminals but they're not always used that way. Sometimes they're just basically poked through the casing and then soldered in the back of. But you don't want to over tighten these because if they are on a circuit board over tighten them like really monkey style uh, can actually physically snap the solder connections inside. So let's get the two leads. It's AC, so they're not polarized. They can go in either way around. So I shall stick them in. And the other one. And we're ready to power it up. I shall put the spade terminals back on to this relay so you can hear it clicking. I could just unravel this. No, I won't unravel it. It's fine. It's probably better not unraveled. Good generous length of cable because, again, it's designed for commercial use. And uh, having too much is better than having too little. Right, let's plug this in and see what happens. So when you plug it in, I'll turn it the right way up for this. It does a wee display test initially. Then the relay clicks in because the temperature is currently set to a sensible 20 degrees Celsius indoor temperature and it's brought the relay in. Uh, keep in mind this is all off recent low voltage. It's brought the relay in uh, because it's calling for heat because it is a heater unit. The user can press this button in the front and uh, normally it displays the temperature in the room, 14 degrees Celsius at the moment, which is quite high. Actual temperature, 10 degrees. It's because I've obviously handled this recently. Uh, but if you... Press this button, the user can then say, right, I don't want it so hot, so I'll cut it down to about 15 degrees Celsius and then press set. And because it's reached the temperature, it will cut out. And if it, the temperature drops again, it will turn back on again. There is a limit to the user's interaction here, because if the person who sets this up presses and holds a button in this for six seconds, Then, 
it gives you option one. And you can click through uh, several options here, but option, well, the one that will interest the Americans is C1, which uh, if you then press, it lets you choose degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to keep it Celsius uh, set. E1 sets the lowest temperature you can set it to. It's currently set for zero, but you could say, I don't want them to turn. If this was being used as a room thermostat, you could say, I want it set for a minimum temperature. They can set it to five degrees so that if it gets really cold and the building's not occupied, it brings the heating on to avoid frost. Next option, E2, this is the temperature that they can set it up to. So I'll, I'll make a note of all these things down in the description down below. So you could say, I don't want uh, the typical office worker who feels the cold quite easily. They will, if you set it, if you allow it to go up too high, they'll just basically run it up. They'll use it as an accelerator and they'll set it to 100 degrees Celsius. So the heater just runs all the time. So let's set a, a maximum cap of 25 degrees Celsius. Oop, I've just uh, exited out of that. I shall go back in. Then it shows its pedigree here because uh, E1, E2, that's the upper and lower temperature. E3 is the temperature hysteresis, which uh, is the difference in the temperature. It allows a slight margin so it doesn't oscillate on and off around the temperature you've set. So you can set a couple of degrees that it'll actually, it won't come back on until it's dropped a couple of degrees below that. And then it'll kick back and it won't do it as soon as it goes one degree below that. And because I've backed out that, I'm going to have to go back in again. I'm just looking at my notes here. So the next setting is E4. This is set to zero, but you can actually set it up to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 if you want. And what this is, it's because this is a universal device, it sets the compressor delay. Or supposing you had a heating system with a great big motor and you didn't want it to cycle too much, um, then you could, uh, basically it sets a delay that, minima that minimizes the time, well, that sets a minimum time before equipment coming on and off. Uh, in the case of compressors that, if you have a refrigeration compressor, and this is probably where they've got that setting because this is a universal module that just has certain parameters set. Um, if you have a refrigeration compressor, you don't want to cycle on and off because if you turn a compressor off and then start it up fairly quickly afterwards, it may stall against the pressure. Um, and also, you want to limit the number of cycles of high-power motors. So the next setting is calibration, I believe. And this is one, two, three, five. Yes. This is set to zero, but you can actually go a minus temperature or a plus temperature. And what that means is if you put the probe in and say, for instance, it's displaying uh, a temperature of um, 20 degrees in the room, but you use a calibrated therm thermometer next to it and it shows it's actually 22, you can actually nudge the value using that so the display reads correctly. It just basically allows you to calibrate it in, on site. Now, I did discover another menu in this. I haven't explored the other menu. It's not documented. This is not a good thing. Uh, but if you press and hold this when it's in one of the other things, it displayed COP last time. Is it going to do it again? Ooh, I don't know what that means. Ooh, shouldn't really click things when you're pressing COP. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I don't know what that is, COP. I'm not going to do anything with that because that's... Uh, I don't know, have you ever been working on a piece of industrial equipment and you press a button and it displays a random menu item. You don't know what it is and you try and back out, and but it's too late. You've changed something and then the machine stops working. That's what that's all about. So those are the main settings. Uh, I think that is it. That is all the settings you've got. E1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 and the uh, centigrade or Fahrenheit or Celsius and Fahrenheit. Okay, right, let's try and open this up. And this is going to be made tricky because I can feel silicone here. And because it's designed for industrial applications, they've sealed the back as well to stop bugs and moisture getting in. Uh, and that is going to make things just that little bit harder. When you actually install this and you feed it through the panel, these little things just slide on and they click up and you just can click them in multiple positions to actually just lock it into position the panel. And it's got this sort of spring for holding it in. Yeah, there's silicon all over this. This isn't great. I may be able to drizzle 
isopropyl alcohol over the wires and free them up. I shall try that, but it may actually limit what I can actually get out of here. Although isopropyl alcohol dissolves the... Uh, it stops the hot melt glue adhering. It's not necessarily going to help much the cables. I'll just shake all that off now. I'll disconnect the wires while it's uh, permeating in. I like the fact they've supplied the separate transformer and the separate relay. It makes it so much more serviceable. I shall shake off the residual isopropanol and poke around here and see. Is this basically going to free these wires now? Yes, it is. This is good. We may actually be getting in here. I may have to do this again once I've opened it just to uh, free it up a bit more. It's not going to help the figure eight cables because the glue will have seeped down between uh, those connections. But we'll see what happens. Now, theoretically, I should get a sharp knife and just slit this label because it is one of the easiest ways to get through labels. I've just slit it way offline there. I was hoping to go into the little groove and have it guide across. Now, I can see loads of silicon under here. And it's making squishy silicon rippy noises. But that's not guaranteed to get us access. But it's a start. If it takes ages, I shall pause momentarily while I gouge into this. Oh, this is, this is looking promising. This is looking very promising. I think I may actually have to slide this up under here, though. What I'm expecting is a very simple rectifier uh, and a smoothing capacitor, operating at 50 or 60 hertz, so no real stress on them. Oh, this is us. We are more or less in. Ugh. The circuit board is latched into the front there. Let's see if I can feed these through. I don't want to snap wires off. Tell you what, uh, now I'm in this far. I'll pop the circuit board out. Let's see if I can just pop this out here. Blech. There's display complete with its protective film, complete with its buttons and a spare button position. I wonder if that's for options is what it's for. The thermistor cable is the easiest to push in because it is round. The other cables less so. If it comes to it. Oh, nope, nope, they're coming off, they're coming off. Or should I say they're coming into it. I'll try and stay in a shot here because I am zoomed in. Pull this one this way and then pull it that way. This is looking very promising. Right, I shall get rid of more of the hot melt glue. I'm seeing the... Well, I'm seeing part of a bridge right far here. Where's the rest of the bridge right far? Oh, there's the bridge right far. These, oh, I know what this is for. This is other outputs. So this is an output with a protection diode for the, again, across the call. There's the transistor that switches it. Right, well, you know what we do now. I shall take a picture of this from a couple of angles and we shall reverse engineer it and see what makes this special. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. This is going to look a bit cluttered. I'll zoom down this. And the reason it's looking a bit cluttered is because this is the bottom circuit board and that's the top circuit board. So you can see the capacitor here sticking up there and the voltage regulator here sticking up there and so on. I couldn't easily separate them because there are 30 uh, connections with a circuit board slotted through another one. And the risk of uh, damaging it uh, was just too high because it is a double sided board. So I decided not to do that and took the picture of it in position. That's why it looks just a little tiny bit cluttered. Now this is first and foremost designed as a universal unit. It's clearly designed from the fact there's three outputs here. Uh, it's designed to switch three relays for uh, refrigeration equipment. And I could imagine that this would be a standard controller used in cases and cold rooms because it has the compressor output here it's got the defrost heater output here and it's got the fan here. And normally in, say, for instance, a cold room or a refrigerated case in a supermarket, you'd have, say, the compressor uh, running to bring the temperature down on the evaporator. But 
every so often it'll switch into defrost and it turns the compressor off, it turns the fans off and it turns the defrost heater on. Now, sometimes it's just drip, natural drip down. Sometimes it's hot gas, but in this case, it's probably a heater it would be designed for. And it would basically defrost the evaporator to stop it icing up. And then it would turn the heater off, wait for a time delay, then turn the fan on and the compressor on again. So that's why it's got those outputs. It also has the facility for a beeper up here for alarm situations. So let's go over this circuitry. The AC comes in here, the 12 volts AC, and it goes through this bridge rectifier. It then forms a rectified and smooth 12 volt rail, which actually wavers between 14 to 17 volts, depending on the uh, load. And that gets smoothed by this capacitor. Then there's this voltage regulator, and then another capacitor with a filtering capacitor, which I didn't actually colour in, but it's just in parallel with this one. And it provides the supply rails to the rest of the circuitry. The microcontroller is tucked down under here, and it drives the display and the buttons with multiplexing. The thermistor inputs, uh, it's got the facility for two here, but it's actually got an extra one up here. Not, I'm guessing there's probably other boards that go onto the same display board because it does have the option for a third thermistor that isn't implemented down here. But what is implemented down here is the uh, unregulated 12 volt output, the ground and uh, a data line connected probably to the microcontroller. Couldn't really trace it back because the components are in the way, but there is a resistor between that and I'd guess it's just data more or less from the microcontroller uh, to control the remote uh, display and button interface. Um, after that, anything else worth mentioning here? There is a programming port. Um, right, schematic. And the schematic is abbreviated just because it would be very cluttered otherwise. Here is the schematic. I shall zoom down just a tiny bit more. Watch me over zoom. No, that's perfect. That's ideal. Here's the 12 volt CC coming in from the chunky transformer. I, hear, I just tapped the transformer off shot there. There's a 470 microfarad capacitor, quite a high value, but that's only because unlike switch mode power supplies, you're used to seeing low value capacitors because the AC is at very high frequency. In this case, it's at 50 or 60 hertz. So this only has to deal with one, well, this has to deal with 100, 120 hertz ripple, and it just means the capacitor's bigger and will last longer. It goes through a 5 volt regulator, a 7805. And then there's another capacitor for smoothing 220 microfarad, 25 volt, and that provides the 5 volt rail for the microcontroller and other circuitry. The thermistor inputs have mega filtering on them. There's the external 10k NDC thermistor, and there is a 100 nano capacitor across it. That's matched to create a potential divider with another 10k resistor to the 0 volt rail. And it also has a filter capacitor across it, so a lot of filtering to make sure the microcontroller sees a nice stable input, even if there's long cable runs, because uh, when you've got a uh, thermistor cable running near mains cables, which is preferably, it would be rooted away from them, it can pick up noise, and this just provides filtering and gives an average value. That is then decoupled from the microcontroller with a 22k resistor. The microcontroller then drives the display via a series of resistors, Standard multiplex display, and also the buttons are all multiplex too. It then has effectively four transistor outputs. Uh, three for relays with a snubber diode across them. And the reason for the snubber diode is when you turn a relay off, the magnetic field collapses, but because it's effectively collapsed into an open load, the voltage spike can be quite high, and it can potentially damage the transistors. So what they do is they put the diode across and when it collapses, it just basically diverts it through the diode and shunts that uh, collapsing field. Um, and it's a standard NPN style Y1 transistor. The three are used for the relays and one is used for the sounder. And it's just, that's more or less it. It is well abbreviated. There was no point drawing all this. It would have taken a lot of tracing around and been fairly pointless. But there are other features on the board for other things. Um, it's just a universal board. It's quite nice. It makes sense to design stuff like that so you can have multiple applications. I shall bring this circuit board back in again, noting that they have got most of the component values marked, including uh, the decoupling capacitors for the thermistor input 104. That means one zero and four zeros, 100,000, 
picofarad, which is the base unit of measurement there. And then that is, of course, 100 nanofarad. And it's just it's an absolutely standard value throughout. 47 ohm for most of the multiplexing resistors for the LEDs and the switches. And then a 5.1K uh, resistor to the uh, buttons, just uh, presumably to prevent the uh, multiplex lines being short-circuited. It's very straightforward. Uh, and just nice because it does have all these components that just make it reliable. The, and they're all serviceable. They're all external to the unit. You've got that chunky, uh, traditional, long-lasting transformer. You've got the easily swappable, chunky relay that is a good brand. And you've got the uh, power supply, which is zero uh, sort of high-frequency components as such. It is literally just a low-frequency power supply, which means this unit is clearly designed to last it's a uh, it's reliable looking whether this is a clone or not i don't know www.sfyb.com but there we have it have it this is model sf-101 sh general purpose well in this case a heating temperature controller very versatile looks very good